Being a CIO in these days really is different from what we have seen in the past. The CIO of the future really is right in the core of the business. You really have to understand what your customers want. To form the right team and to bring the right team to the playground is very important and I like actually sort of thinking about these team constellations. What really important is for me to have a, have a very good sort of mission because I think the mission is more important than money. If we go on working in the same ways we did in the past, we're not going to succeed. It's a matter of a change in the mind. The most important asset we have, it's the people, not the technology. This is CIONet TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today in Nuremberg with Dr. Markus Schmitz. Markus studied social sciences and history. And after completing his doctorate, he initially worked as a management consultant in the telco industry, also in human resources and in the public sector. So welcome, uh, Markus. Thank you so much. Let's start off this conversation with um, you telling me about the, the big portal project that you did. What was the, the challenge that you had and, and how did you approach this? Well, the, the actual challenge was we had a portal, but nobody really used it. Okay. So when we asked people how sort of is the portal approach of the federal agency, they would say, well, yes, there is a web page, mm -hmm. but uh, we actually need to be an employee of the federal agency to understand how it works. Okay. So we said, okay, we, we understand, and we set up to do, do a sort of a totally new approach we set up an agile project team and we totally reset our internet approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were three main steps. The first one was we set up a completely new portal entry, which is organized alongside to the life situations of people. So we did customer experiences with the people, with the customers, which are the citizens of Germany, not yep. just sort of experts within the federal agency. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, we launched a brand new portal. Okay. And then in the next years to follow, we actually brought up completely new e-services and uh, new self-assessment tools so okay. that people could actually play on our web page to find out what is the best job for myself, what is a good vocational training, yep. and they can do all the sort of necessary online applications with us. And this was a totally new experience for us. Because the main focus of the employment agency is to help people find a new job. Is that one of the main functions that... Uh... Exactly. So it's two basic pillars. The first one is that people who are eligible for unemployment benefits, they need a very low barrier to get these benefits. Okay. And just to give an example, we put in a new online track for applying for unemployment benefits. Okay. And last year we had more than 1 million online applications, oh. which is quite big for us. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the second thing is, of course, that we offer vacancies and job opportunities. Yeah. And what we saw is that people don't really like to come into our offices to ask the mm -hmm. conventional counseling offices. So we developed together with psychologists what we call self-assessment tools. Mm -hmm. So you could ask yourselves questions and by the end of the day you could actually recommendations of the top 10 most fitable vocational trainings that might fit to you. And we find out and we found out that people actually like to play in, with this sort of, it's a completely new sort of generation of products we're actually developing right now. So you're matching uh, unemployed, unemployed people with trainings that they can follow and also with potential jobs that they could exactly. uh, go for. Exactly. Okay. So how did you approach this project? Because doing a, a complete revamp of such a portal is, is a big thing. How, what, was the, what was the approach? You said it was agile? Exactly. And, and, and the new approach was, first of all, we said if we develop this new brand new portal in the same way we developed the old one, we're going to fail again. Uh -huh. So the first thing was we um, said we want an interdisciplinary team of all the competencies that we have within our agency. Mm -hmm. So the business side, the technological side, this was the first approach. The second was that we actually going to ask our customers because they themselves know the best what they want. Yep. So what we did is we uh, had a cooperation here with the Fraunhofer Institute. They have a test cafe in Nuremberg, the Josephs. And we went out there and we had uh, school pupils coming in. They would actually check on our new sort of life uh, situations. They would check on our new projects. We would actually have people passing by, going shopping, 
ask them just to give us their personal feedback. So we did the whole customer story together with our customers. And in the end, sort of, we had a new sort of set of what we call life situations that people would actually uh, understand, like, I get unemployed, I want to have a new job. Mm -hmm. I sort of finished school, I need a vocational training. Yep. And sort of, uh, we're going to uh, found a family how to apply for child benefits. So this is sort of the totally new approach, and we found out in the beginning we had 10 million visitors every month. And this was a real big sort of change towards the old uh, portal we had. Nobody really knew what we were responsible for. And yeah. now we see with the search engine optimization we are doing that more and more people come to our portal. Mm -hmm. And that means that they need to come less to your offices and can do more online. So you, you, um, you can save some money there with the, with the project. Oh. Uh, do you, have you calculated the results of this? Yeah, project? of course. The first thing is that we see is that the sort of the online rates they grow I incredibly. So last year, as I told you, we had more than one million uh, online applications for unemployment benefits. It's a rate of forty-four percent of all applications. Okay, wow. This year, we're going to aim to have more than fifty percent. So digital should be the rule, not the exception. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of a, a real big shift, sort of in how mm -hmm. public services are being recognized. The thing is, uh, do we want to save money with our online approach? No, we actually want to reinvest sort of our counseling services. Mm -hmm. We don't think that we have a lot of value if we sort of spend much time in processing applications. Mm -hmm. We think sort of the benefit we can actually bring to the people is giving them a good counseling on their job perspectives. Yeah. So we actually take sort of the people um, uh, to, to do a more professional counseling services for the people who actually then come to us. C uh, could you give a couple of examples of the of the services that are in there and how they help the the people in Germany? Yeah. Well, the first thing is that what we found out is that people want don't want to do more than three clicks to get all the information they need. So the whole structure of the portal is that you need at maximum three clicks uh -huh. to get all the information if it comes to child benefits, unemployment benefits, or job perspectives. Okay. This was the first layer we put onto our portal. Mm -hmm. The second aim of our customers was they said, well, if we want to apply for, for example, uh, unemployment benefits, we actually want to have a good guided customer journey. Okay. So um, if you have the question saying, I want to apply for unemployment benefits, three clicks, you find sort of the, the, the online track, and then you get guided through the whole process. You can apply for benefits, you get the results being transmitted into your sort of account. Yep. You see when the money is going to be processed, how much money you're going to have to wait for and mm -hmm. for how long. Yep. And if you have a question, you can actually directly ask sort of an officer, why don't I get more than X, Y, Z euros? So this is sort of the second feature. And the third feature is that we found out that people say, well, if I have sort of, um, for example, a personal question according to my job I'm having right now, can I myself actually find out how much money, for example, I earn? Mm -hmm. And so if you're a journalist in Berlin, you can use our portal, three clicks, and you find out, well, I'm a journalist in Berlin, how much money would I on average earn? Because we have all the data behind. Mm -hmm. And so you see, we have, according to the questions you have, we have different options in that portal. And so according to your interests, you get navigated. And this is never really done. Mm -hmm. So it's a, per, it's a permanent, um, sort of invest into optimizing that portal because we learn from the customer journeys from the co-innovation workshops we do mm -hmm. and we improve sort of the services on that platform. Okay and how did you get the capabilities in-house to to do have this very user-friendly and more customer journey oriented? Did you get in some outside help or uh, how, how did you uh, manage that? Yes we did. This is actually I would say sort of the, the second biggest projects we actually start on, it's the agile transition. Mm -hmm. Because when, we, when I started here, we, we sat together with the management team and said, if we go on working in the same ways we did in the past, we're not going to succeed. Yeah. So what we said is we're going to have, we call it ag agile transition because we don't like to be getting transformed because we said it's a process that we actually ourselves manage. We are the transition sort of uh, in, the, in the responsibility to do the transition process. So we set up a transition team. Uh, we did a, um, an internship, uh, an internal um, workshop in Berlin. We sat together with the guys from Zalando, ING, Deber, Bank, just to get different ideas. And then we sat together and set up our own 
agile agenda for the federal agency. Mm -hmm. And so we said, well, we need coaching for our project managers. We need yeah. coaching for ourselves. So we set up our own qualification scheme. We said we need to have new um, room concepts where our team can work. So we built up an agile campus in Nuremberg where 170 software engineering and the business side sits together. Okay. We said, well, we need to have a, what we call lighthouse projects to get started. So we did sort of a first uh, with the agile project I've just mentioned, it was the first lighthouse project for us. And then we said, we need actually to talk about it. So what we did is we did an agile roadshow and we reached 800 of our employees to explain to them what we actually want to do okay. and to take them on board. So it's actually like a, a small a movement that started very on a very small level. Mm -hmm. And over the time, we actually developed this into a big project. And now we say the agile transition within sort of the Federal Agency of Employment has started in the IT department, but it has to grow. Yep. And so um, for me, it's not just a matter of uh, going from waterfall to scrum. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of a change in the minds we have. And what really might help is that I actually come from the business side originally, mm -hmm. and I now bring together the world of the IT technology part and the business side, and together we actually have to go all the way down the road. Mm -hmm. And so actually, this sort of the, the new sort of mind shift saying we want to work interdisciplinary, we want to ask our customers and not we don't know what they think that we ask themselves and we want to be faster and we want to see what the results are. These are the mo main components of our agile transition. Okay. So it's a mind shift. It's a culture shift almost. It is. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. And something that can that start small and then grows bigger and bigger with lighthouse projects. And, and, and so that's how you can because it's a cultural change that you need to bring into the organization. Of course. In, I can imagine, quite traditional organization. And this actually is the, the main challenge we are facing is because it's very easy to say we, we take the HR manifesto, write federal agency on top and say and this is it. the way to go. Everyone would say from tomorrow onwards, yes, we are agile now. The thing really is to, to reach the hearts of the people. Mm -hmm. So what we actually have to do is project by project, we have to uh, actually make people experience that it makes fun working that way. Mm -hmm. So what we actually have done is as a management team, we call it a stage gate um, process. So mm -hmm. every project that wants to um, show their results to the management team can apply for it. Okay. So, and if you walk down my floor, you will see 10 or 12 examples of recent stage gates. So we have e-justice, we have e-recruiting, we have e-procurement. So all these different projects are going on we are visiting them, the, the management team, the project teams, and even customers sit down together in a big room and we look onto the results. And this is a completely new culture and sort of, and people get proud of yep. showing what they have reached. And uh, I think this is much more effective than saying we are all agile now, so mm -hmm. let's, let's get started. It's really a matter of living this new approach and showing that the management is interested, that we go and see that we are there where the people are. And um, it takes a lot of time and effort, mm -hmm. but I think that we have no other chance to do a big transformation for such a big public service organization. And mm -hmm. it will take years. We have just started. Uh -huh. And um, so I really know that we, it takes time and you have to bring out good results, good examples to convince the people that that is the right way to go. Yeah. And people like to be successful. And we see that agile projects are more successful than other ones. And it's important to celebrate success and yeah, to show success. Definitely. And to put people in the spotlight so that they can shine and and that makes them happy with what they do and that and like that they take more responsibility and uh, so it's it's like um, something that reinforces itself once exactly. it started. Okay. And for me, it's much more important because being a public service uh, employee, I would say, well, we are all sort of, we are very loyal to the government and whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not just about fulfilling your job. I think people should have fun doing their job. Mm -hmm. And um, and if you have sort of these new agile working methods, I think it makes much more fun doing your job, yep. getting good results, and actually what you said is you have to celebrate the results. Like yesterday we had the e-government awards in Berlin and our project Cash BR, which is sort of a new online project, got the first sort of one of the first prizes which was awarded there and this makes our, our people proud and this is yep. really good. Okay. And 
is it possible to estimate how, how, what percentage of your team has already made the shift? And, and will you ever get to 100%? Oh, this is a very big question, to be <laughs> honest. No. Um, because if I, if I look at onto our online campus, uh -huh. so we have our own digital campus there, where about, I would say, four or 500 people are working, I would say they are pretty much down the road because mm -hmm. they are, were the first ones where we actually did our Lighthouse projects and they are actually, because of the way how we develop software, it's, it's, they're more sort of acquainted to agile methods. Yeah. If we come to more, I would say, enterprise track modes like the ERP campus, yep. they are a bit more far away. But again, we have the collection management within my department mm -hmm. and we actually did an agile pilot there as well. So it's not just a matter of standard software or sort of online services. Mm -hmm. So, but if you ask me, there's still, we still need two, three, four years to get the whole organization being transitioned, not yep. transformed. Uh, but it's really hard to, 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 to talk about a real quota. Because you, you, you told me in preparation that you have a big SAP uh, competence center yeah. that pays out a lot of money to yeah. the... Um, yeah. And so it's gonna... So, so that's not an, uh, a natural environment to, to implement agile concepts, I, I can imagine. That's it is not, but you can sort of implement agile components into that continent as well. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we, uh, we have the collection management because, of course, people get unemployment benefits. And, of course, when they get back into job, they have to repay money we have paid for them in advance. Ah, okay. So our sort of the whole social security system pays in advance. The result is we have a very big collection management. So it's a big topic for us. Okay. Uh, it's all over in Europe the same way because you pay in advance because people... Need their, afford, money. They yep. need their money. <laughs> so, and we have, of course, one of, I think, one of the biggest SAP installations within the public service in Europe. And uh, everyone said, well, within the SAP continent, you really can't be agile. We set up an agile project team with the IT colleagues, the people from the collection management. We t took colleagues from the collection management all over Germany. We have three, four hubs where we do that. Mm -hmm brought them together here in the Agile campus, and then they worked our solutions within sort of the SAP standard to get improvements. And we had really, really good results. Uh -huh. And we got ex excellent feedback. We sort of asked the people working in the collection management and said, wow, we didn't believe that within the SAP continent, you can do that. No. So of course, it's not the full, sort of full scale Agile um, program, but actually you can sort of take important elements and, and, and invest into that as well. Okay. So you have um, a big IT team here, one of the biggest in the government in Germany, I understand. And you have a, a big agency, uh, around 90,000 people that work in the agency. Yeah, that's right. So you, could you explain a bit how the, the agile mindset uh, also went from IT to, the, to other business units and how how that worked? I would say we're still in the beginning, to be honest, because um, I've just started here within the IT department, which is quite big, and we also have some business units, like the child benefit system is also, because it's a shared service, it's part of my department. Mm -hmm. And I think these two sort of big pillars of my department are on the agile way. Okay. We are now actually, we have very intensive and I think very constructive discussions with the business departments mm -hmm. to go that way. but. You're hitting at a very important point. I think the public service in general can't work in the same manner as it done 10, 20 years beforehand mm -hmm. if it want to, wants to succeed. Yep. So, but it's still a long way along the lines actually to bring together that actually public service headquarters work in an agile method. We have just started yep. and I've got some very good counterparts and colleagues like especially those ones in the long-term unemployment system. They are very innovative and they actually play a very active role, but it takes time. I've because it's first the top management that needs yeah. to be convinced. Exactly. Otherwise, it's not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. yeah. But for example, in two weeks time, we have a, within our board meeting, we're actually going to present sort of what we have been doing mm -hmm. on the agile uh, sort of uh, continent in the recent uh, months and years. Mm -hmm. And so there is a, a growing awareness. But to be honest, we are within the public sector, we are still in the beginning, to be very honest. How is IT and digital organized here in the uh, in, in, in the HC? You're 1,500 plus people. How yeah. how do you organize them? 
Well, first of all, um, within the federal agency, um, the CIO position is being organized as a general representative. So I've got sort of a direct reporting into the board. Mm -hmm. This is one which is quite important because um, with the digitalization, sort of the whole business model gets transformed over the over the time. So it's important that the IT department has a sort of prominent role. The second uh, aspect is that we have full control over the whole project budget. So uh, we can actually take care that sort of the investments goes into the right digital sort of uh, sphere. Mm -hmm. And then uh, thirdly, what is very important is that we have within the headquarters, we do have sort of the strategy unit. So for me, it's very important that the BAs strategy actually transform into our IT strategy that goes together, it's coherent. Yep. So this is what we sort of actually take care of in the, in the headquarters and then we have the business counterparts here within the headquarters that actually make sure that IT and business part works together in agile mode. So this is actually how we have actually set up the, the whole IT department. And then of course we have got the production unit as, as I call it, it's the IT system house. Yeah. It has sort of the big branch of the system development, which is sort of those parts that actually develop projects and, and uh, develop the systems that are existing. And we have the IT production that actually takes care of the whole of the whole running part. And that's your data the, center and the data center and everything and like that. So this is the, how we are organized, and we're actually right in the heart of the of the headquarters. Okay, and you do a lot of you do everything inside, or you outsource as well. How is uh, how how is that? Is that Actually, what we do is all the core competencies lies within the federal agency and are being run by our own, yeah. own um, executive staff. But of course, it's sort of a mixture of internal and external delivery. So roughly speaking, we do 60% internally and 40% is being done by external suppliers. And it's just a matter of getting the skills on board, but also you want to breathe sort of according to, to the the project's amount you are actually doing yeah. and it gives you flexibility and you can actually decide which competencies to to buy in or not. Yeah. But what's very important to me is that we defined all the key roles and they are internally staffed exclusively. Yeah. So you have a business background. Yeah. You, I mean, you must be a little bit technical savvy to run an IT uh, team like this, no? Exactly, definitely. So how did, how did you do that? Because if you study science and, and, and social science and history, or social science and history, how do you get in technical savvy enough to be a CIO? Well, actually, so I have a little bit of a weird um, CV, to be mm -hmm. honest, because I have never done what I've studied, really. Okay. So, <laughs> but actually, from the beginning, actually, uh, starting with my consulting career, I actually was in, in IT and technological projects. Okay. So it's actually from the right beginning of when I, when I left university. And actually, the first projects when I came over to the Federal Agency of Employment in 2005 was a virtual labor market. The second one was to build up, I think, one of the biggest electronic file systems within the public sector. Yeah. So wherever I go, sort of IT follows me. <laughs> so it was um, quite a, quite a, I think, good decision just to think about taking a technological guy to run the IT department or s someone who has actually seen both sides yeah. over the last decade. So when um, I was asked to take over this position, the idea was to bring together both sides, sort of have a good sort of view on the technological side, on the IT side with all the projects I've done recently. Yep. And then secondly, sort of bring in a good understanding of the business side. Because mm -hmm. if you ask me is what really is crucial to the people, uh, to our own employees, but also to our customers that we deliver the best services for their needs. Yep. And you need to understand both sides of the stories. Of course. And of course, I do have excellent experts mm -hmm. who actually know all the technologies, techs we have here on board. So yep. it's a matter of how you form your own team. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of what you bring yep. to the party, but also what your team actually, what competencies your team has. Yep. So what in, in, in an environment like this, what are the, the, the skills, in your view, that a CIO needs to, to be successful? Well, on the one hand side, is I think you, um, you need to, um, to have a really good view on the business side. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, it, it develops rapidly. The customer needs develop rapidly and you really have to understand what your customers want. So this is the one first thing is. The second thing is you need to understand your technology stacks. Mm -hmm. So sort of what is actually what you have in your sort of in your technology stack within your company and to bring both sides together. The more and more important gets really to overbridge the gaps between the different competencies. Because we do have, of course, the business side, we do have the technological side, and yep. actually you really need to overbridge these continents. And this is actually one of my roles to, dr to draw the big picture, to say how the strategy is going to lead us within the next five years, mm -hmm. and then to break down strategy into sort of concrete projects, concrete tasks to get things done. Mm -hmm. Because this is something really the public sector is not very good in. We are very good in writing papers, but the thing is really to break down things and to get things done yeah. to, to have successful projects. Okay. Now, in, in successful projects is, means that you need good people. Yeah. How do you, in a um, government and, and environment, attract good people? Because I can imagine that that's a challenge. So. This is a, a real a big challenge, you, you, you are right. And especially here in, at the campus in Nuremberg, uh, as we talked about beforehand, you have got Adidas, you have got Siemens, you have got really big players who mm -hmm. are, uh, of course, competitors. But I think we do have some assets others haven't. First of all, it's our mission. And uh, the mission is really, uh, and many people we hire actually say this is one of the reasons why they come to us. Like the public sector mission for us bringing people and jobs together mm -hmm. is something that people attracts, first yeah. of all. Secondly, we give you a lot of responsibility if you come to us. So if you, if you are a talented person, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, how old you are. If you want to, you can take over a lot of responsibility, you get big projects with big budgets, and you really can do things. Yeah. And this is really attractive for many You can people. have an impact. If you really Definitely. do well, you can so, have an impact on society. Yeah. And, and thirdly, um, if we see that, sort of, uh, that you take your chances, if you sort of take over responsibility, I think we can actually promote and uh, promote those people and they can make very interesting careers. Oh, yeah. This is the third thing. And the fourth thing is what some people tell me who we got hired, they say, well, within the federal agency, you're such a big IT organization, you can find whatever technology you want to. So it's really interesting if you want to play with different and modern technologies. And so um, overall, I think there are some good arguments to come to the federal agency, but of course the, the, the competition is fierce. Yeah. And so I, I can imagine also an, an important part of your role is, like you said, to be the visionary and to show where people are going and, and to create an environment that is attractive for people to... So being a good leader is important in an environment like this, right? It is definitely, and you need sort of different I was, leadership competencies to mm -hmm. succeed in that role. The yeah. first thing is, I see myself a little as being a pace setter, a pace maker. Mm -hmm. So you really need to have a clear compass, a clear focus where you want to go to, and you need to, to, to look that actually the agenda gets realized. This is the first thing is, so, and that's the reason why I'm a, I really like sort of the, the new public management approach, mm -hmm. like leading by objectives, like having clear targets, and we are one of the very few public sector organizations that I know of who pay their salaries and compensation of executive staff based on performance. Wow. It's about 15%, which is a lot for public sector mm -hmm. standards. But this actually makes, uh, um, this makes uh, that your organization really moves forward and doesn't yeah. stand where it is. So um, actually, I think it's this, this, this new public management approach. It's this pace setting, performance management view. But then again, um, I think it's very important for me to communicate and also to be a good coach to your people. Yeah. So what I actually have is for, for new or young executives, I actually sit down to, if they want to, it's, it's voluntary, I sit down with them every two, three months, have a coffee, and, and they get feedback from my side, and they yeah. can ask any questions they want to. And this really helps because uh, we are quite a big organization, and I don't want that sort of talent gets lost within my organization. Mm -hmm. So people are important for you? Definitely. Okay. This is actually the way, this is the, the the most important asset we have, it's the people, not the technology. Mm -hmm. I can buy that from the yeah. shelf. But it's to develop the people, and this is the biggest challenge within the public sector IT organization mm -hmm. that I can think of. Because in, in this series, we look yeah. at the uh, MBTI profile. Yeah. And I understood from, uh, from you that, that you have an ESFG uh, profile, which is described as follows. 
It's uh, an ESFG is is the console. He's um, um, you're a con conscientious helper. They are sensitive to the needs of others, energetically dedicated to their responsibility. Uh, ESFGs are highly attuned to the emotional environment and attentive to both the feelings of others and the perception of others that others have of them. Mm -hmm. They like a sense of harmony, uh, cooperation around them, and they're eager to please and to provide. And typical strong uh, strengths are strong practical skills, a strong sense of duty, uh, loyalty, sensitivity, warm and good at connecting with, uh, with others. Does that picture a little bit how, how you see yourself? Yes, partly I, I could see myself, yes, um, because I think um, if I look to, to my own sort of uh, personality, I think it's very important really to, to bring good teams together, to form good teams and not just sort of to, to lead by delegation and say you do this or that. So I actually think it's sort of it's like a, a football coach to form the right team and yeah. to bring the right team to the playground is very important and I like actually sort of thinking about these team constellations. Okay. So uh, I would say yes, that's right. Uh, secondly, to have sort of a strong sense of responsibility is actually something that, that is uh, part of my character. Mm -hmm. uh, it might also be a weakness, it's just a matter of how you look at it. <laughs> but I think sort of, uh, it's, it's a bit of sort of my, my, my personal thing that's just to say I'm very committed to the mission. And that's actually the reason why I um, did no longer work for the management consulting business and went to the public sector. It's actually because I think the mission to me is more important than money. And that's the reason why I say, well, sort of working for the federal agency, bringing people and, and work together is to me one of the most motivating things to do. And so to this mission, I'm really loyal and I really like doing that. So if you, if you take it from these two sides, yes, it describes a little bit of what I am. Yeah, absolutely. So strong sense of duty, loyal, and, 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 and you've, you're definitely a, a strong people person that that uh, that comes out so how do you I'm, I'm i'm curious how what is the best way to coach people in 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 your team how, what are the practical things that you do you say we sit together on a regular basis have coffee but are there other techniques that you use yes of course the first of all what we do is i give them uh, the stage to present their results Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, is, uh, if, if people do a good job, they want to be proud of themselves and I uh, need to celebrate that. So what I do is if I see that people have worked out a very interesting piece of work, they get the chance to, to present themselves. So we do have executive um, strategy uh, meetings off-site where we invite those people. It's like a little, it's an honor that to go there and, and present in Berlin or Munich to our sort of executive management council, yep. very big results. The, the second thing is um, that we also have this, these stage gates I talked about. So actually we make actually people being proud of presenting their results to us. Mm -hmm. So I actually give them a, a scenery within, uh, within sort of our management group so that people um, see, oh, cook like this, this person really did a good job. Then we have sort of career tracks. So what we also do is we see when people get retired in the next year. There are quite a few, to be honest. So what we actually, of course, do we actually track record of who is evolving right now. And so uh, we are actually now developing what we sort of a success, a successor planning. So who is going to move into which position over the next year? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you are sort of a young person, if you're a talented, motivated person, so there are a lot of opportunities for us. And of course, we talk about that. We say, well, look, we have these career tracks. We have just sort of founded a women's network because what I see is we have so many talented women. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to applying, we often don't see the applications. So uh, there's sort of quite a few things where I'm now trying to, to bring those people to the front. What's the percentage of women in the, in the IT team over here? In the whole IT team, I think it's about 15%. 15? 15%, 15. 15 okay. overall. And do you have a target to increase that? Yes, I do have, but I, d I didn't give it a number because I think if you do, do it at like 30%, which is quite on vogue, mm -hmm. I don't think it's that's, that's, that's the right way. But what we do is with this women's network, I try to encourage to bring people onto the first executive level. On the first executive level, there are no women right now. If you go, go to the second level, there are quite a few. Okay. And so what you really have to do is you have to motivate them actually to bring them up the ladder. Okay. I was, we, we had an interview with uh, Sabine Vrat, who is the CIO of Coca-Cola. Yeah. Yeah. 
a very successful uh, uh, woman uh, CIO, and she told me that uh, when you have a meeting and there's three women uh, present in the meeting, you have a completely different meeting. If there's only one or two, yeah. but if, as, as soon as you have three uh, women in a meeting, then the atmosphere changes, the productivity changes, and so on and so on. Is this something that you... That you, do you see a difference? It, it is, no, it is actually true. When, before I came to the IT department, I worked in different, you know, I was in charge of different uh, roles you have just mentioned. And in all these different roles, I had women on my management teams. It's yeah. the first yeah. time coming to the <laughs> IT department um, that sort of, uh, that I didn't find any women in that, in that, in that team. I think yeah. it's not good at all. I think we need to have diverse, and it's not just a matter of women and, and men, we need to have diverse teams because they bring out the best, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. But it takes time to, to bring in the right talent. And um, it's not just, yeah, it's not just a matter about saying 20, 30 percent is the right quota. It's really about a good team mixture. And do you use positive discrimination, if that's a word, where if you have two people that have the same skills and you need to select and you go for the minorities, the women and so on, or? Is, is that a, a, a policy that you have in here? Or well, I think you need to maybe force it a little bit yeah, to become more diverse. No, the thing is when we have thought of if, if somebody gets retired or we have to replace uh, this person, the first thing is that if we talk about, I think I always want to have at least one or two uh, suggestions for women who could take over that post. Yeah. Then we have got, of course, the uh, official process, but I always want to see is, is there anyone around? So I want at least one or two suggestions because I think it's really important, as you say, just to, to, um, to push that a yeah. little bit more. In your, in, in your career or maybe in your personal life as well, did you have any mentors, any people that you looked up to that you, that way you learned a lot from and who were they? Yes, of course, there were actually quite a few, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, well, the first one I really sort of admired was my professor at the University of Oxford. Oxford. Um, okay. It was Ro Robert Fitzroy Fossey, was the first Carroll professor of Irish history uh, <laughs> at, ha at, at Oxford University. And because he was sort of, when he actually took over that, that uh, professorship, this discipline, Irish history, was very small. It was an exotic sort of thing. And he really sort of uh, had his vision because saying, and it was at times of the Northern Irish Irish conflict, that this is a very important topic for that university. Irish and history. Irish history. <laughs> and when he retired, it was really interesting. Uh, you could really see sort of what he had developed from the small beginnings to the, to the time mm -hmm. when he left. And every sort of, from him I really learned is that you have a clear vision. If you have a, if you have a really important target, stick to it and, and, and you know, don't, don't, don't let it lose, just, just go to the end. Mm -hmm. And he was very important to me and we still are in contact. So, okay. and, and I think he's actually one of the most brilliant academics I've ever met and, and he was very inspiring. And, I, and actually I learned quite a little bit. And also sort of this, this interdisciplinary approach and this international approach was, was really interesting because the Irish community is in, in Australia, North America. Yeah, it was really interesting. Irish food. pubs around the world. And <laughs> yeah, especially, yeah. You should go to them. They're really good. Good, good places to meet people. And, and the second person really was sort of a former CEO of, of the federal agency, Frank-Jürgen Weise. He actually came from the business side. He was in the, um, in the German industry and then came during the hard reforms to the federal agency. Mm -hmm. And he actually introduced the, the methods of the, of the new public management approach. And I think uh, I saw sort of the old federal agency, very bureaucratic, very slow, yeah. and how it evolved to a modern service provider. And these years to see how you can actually do a turnaround from a very bureaucratic, old-fashioned organization to a, what I would say rather modern yeah. service provider was one of the most stressful, but also one of the most meaningful job experience I had. So mm -hmm. I, I learned actually quite a little bit from, from him and I think really I like the way we work together now sort of that he's retired. You yep. can value it much more than when you work <laughs> every day on, 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 the same, on the same topic. And, and outside of, uh, let's say, outside of business, outside of work, are there people that you look up to that you say these are really inspiring people in, 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 in my life or where I can, um, that I admire well, actually, 
the, the people I really admire are sort of people who are sort of very close to me. So that's not an abstract thing. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, of course, I do admire people, you know, a historian as I am. Of course, I, I really admire all those people who founded the the, the um, German. Republic after the Second World War, okay. because I, with the history of the Second World War, sort of looking at at the democratic principles, at the European integration, this is for me, those people are real heroes, mm -hmm. like Konrad Adenauer or Hallstein or all those people like uh, uh, De Gaulle and people like that. So I really sort of think that in these days, given the circumstances they were facing, I think these are people I really admire and. Uh, I th still think that the, vil the values they actually lived for, like the European integration, democracy, liberty, equality, they are actually the values I really adhere to. Okay. So on an abstract level, I would say these are the people I really sort of look yeah. up to. Okay. You have a family and children? Definitely, yeah. Okay. I have. How old are your children? My children are now uh, 8 and 11. 8 and 11. So they're still young? They're very young, yeah. But what are the, what are the values, the principles that you want to that you want to give to your children. You know, say, I will be happy if they take along, if they only take this from me, then I will be happy. Um, there are quite a few things actually, I, I hope I'm going <laughs> to hand over them to. But first of all, I, I really do believe in, in, in the Christian values. Mm -hmm. So to be honest uh, with each other, to be fair with each other is to me really important within my job, but also within sort of uh, in the private field. Yep. And I would say that if they sort of get adult and if they sort of live their own lives, that they adhere to these principles. This is very important to me. Yeah. The second thing is really to be open-minded when it comes to, to qualification, to learning. Mm -hmm. Because I think this is one of the best values you really can give to your children to be curious, to not sort of to, you're never done with that one. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of a second thing that is, is very important for them. And the third thing really is that, that they really value how important democracy, uh, liberty and, 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 and equality are for us in Europe. Um, because um, for them, of course, all these times of wars we have seen in Europe, they have never seen that. But I think sort of to see that this is a value in itself yep. is to me very important. So it's, it's Christian beliefs, it's really this, uh, the question of qualification, yeah. and the third thing is sort of the, the European and the democratic principles. Yeah, because I mean, we live in the best possible times ever, no? Yes, but we can't really value that. No, because that, we take that it for granted. That is what makes me nervous. Oh, yeah. I mean, we take it for granted, it's, we haven't yeah. seen wars, we haven't seen poverty, the majority of people have good lives, and so on and so on, uh, in the world immediate world around us. And uh, so, so, yeah, I, I, I can absolutely follow that. Just one thing I was thinking about when I was uh, younger, <laughs> uh, there was Helmut Kohl saying, uh, the European Union is a question of peace or war in Europe. And when he said that, it is years and years and years ago, I said, I don't understand that. Why mm -hmm. is it that dramatic? But now, 20, 30 years later, I think now I know what he meant. Yep. Um, it sounded so drastic in, in that in that years when I first heard that. And yep. nowadays, I, I very often think about that, that we shouldn't take Europe for granted. It's such a value that you can mm -hmm. cross borders without getting checked, yet you can meet people like us. You know, you just uh, came from Brussels to Nuremberg. You just went through and we met together and tomorrow you go your way. And I think this is such a big value for us and we shouldn't underestimate how important that is yep. for us. Okay. Um, another thing that um, um, intrigues me or that I would like to know is when you get up in the morning, what makes you happy? When do you say, well, this is going to be a great day? What, what are the triggers for you to be really, to, to feel really uh, excited and good? Actually, three things. The first thing is when the sun is up, <laughs> I'm, I'm the happiest person in the world. Um, because then I can go with my dog jogging in the morning. The second thing is when I see my children, my, my wife, mm -hmm. because the family life is very important to me. And this is a good day. You wake yep. up in the morning, the sun is up and the family is there mm -hmm. and you're not in a hotel somewhere in the world. And the third thing is if I, if I think sort of, if I go to work, they say, well, what I'm doing makes sense. Yep. And this is very important. This is of my compass. Yep. And if two of these three things are there, it's a good day. Okay. So. I mean, we do this series uh, for future CIOs so yeah. that they can learn how current uh, top digital leaders around Europe and around the world, how they think, how they are wired. 
Do you have any um, any advice that you would give to uh, to people that are five, ten years younger and aspire to be in uh, similar roles like you have here? Well, the big, big, big word, <laughs> <laughs> but well, well, but some some personal experiences. The first thing is be adventurous. So what I say is really uh, don't stick to the edge. We call it Beckenrandschwimmer in Germany. Beckenrand uh, so really try sort of try to figure out sort of your own vision and follow it. Mm -hmm. This is the first thing. Is the second thing is being a CIO in these days really is different from what we have seen in the past. So I would really say that uh, being a CIO is you are really responsible for transforming the business model of the organization you're working for. You're not just a technological. Yeah. guy who sits in the basement uh, providing IT services. Mm -hmm. So be a little bit more, I would say, um, proud of what you're doing and be a little bit more outspoken and, and really invest the time in the business discussions in your company and don't step back and say is it, we, are, we are just a technological guys. And I think this is actually from the CEO of the future really is right in the core of the business. Mm -hmm. And this if you ask me, it's totally different to what I've seen 10 years ago yeah. when they were just sort of the, the fulfillment on the fulfillment side. Yeah. Now I would really see is to be more sort of ambitious to that because I see many colleagues who say, oh, well, this is a business question. I, I read, I, I'm not going to discuss with, with, mm -hmm. with that on that one. Okay. So you've been in this role, uh, what is it now, f uh, for three, four years, three years? Two and a half, three, three and years. And a half. Mm -hmm. So how do you see your future? How you, I mean, you obviously enjoying your, your job. You're still not, not done with, uh, with this no. work, I, I guess. Um. Actually, we'll never be done, really. So <laughs> this makes it a little bit difficult. Now, actually, I think now, uh, these days, sort of being in the heart of the digital transformation within society is, to me, one of the most, I would say, fascinating jobs you can have right now. So mm -hmm. I really don't think about uh, what might be the next step to do. Yep. But of course, as, as I am, as I am, uh, being sort of curious about new topics, I'm not going to, I'm not really, so, I, we don't know where my, my path is going to lead me, uh, yep. to, to which direction. But uh, the thing is, what really important is for me to have a, have a very good sort of mission and to have a very, a, a team I really like, sort of, I really like to work with. So I would say the next years are really pretty much full with sort of getting this digital transformation of the federal agency going. Yep. But we'll see where I'm going to be in the next years. I don't know. Okay, great. And with that, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for this wonderful conversation. Thank and you I very wish much. you a lot of success in your uh, further work with your team. It was a pleasure having you here and all the best to you again. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.